The worst failure of this prime minister this year is the promise to balance the budget. The promise was made, but the parliamentary budget officer tabled a report which forecast the deficit to $28 billion. Why did the Prime Minister mislead Canadians about balancing the budget. The Right Honourable the Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, our commitment in 2015 was to create economic growth to benefit the middle class and those working hard to join it. That's exactly what we delivered by reducing taxes for the middle class, by increasing taxes on the 1% wealthiest Canadians. We brought in the Canada Child Benefits, which helped nine families out of 10, and which helped uh, lift 300,000 children out of poverty. We know there's still a lot of work to be done. Infrastructure investment, the fight against poverty, investing in our seniors and youth. We will continue. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Canadians had a choice and Canadians voted for a balanced budget. Yeah. That was the promise that this Prime Minister <laughs> ran on. And now we find out that his temporary and tiny deficits are now massive and permanent. They're not $10 billion, they're not $15 billion, not $20, not $25. The parliamentary budget officer says they could grow to as high as $30 billion. Deficits today mean higher taxes tomorrow. Will the Prime Minister tell Canadians in what year the budget will be balanced? Well, Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, one of the first things we discovered when we came to office in 2015 was that the Conservatives' phony balancing of the budget actually hurt Canadians. It hurt our veterans. It hurt our public service. It cut in Canadian border services and police services. They cut services that Canadians needed right across the country in order to present a phony budget balance just in time for the election. Well, we made a different choice, Mr. Speaker, to invest in Canadians. And what has that delivered? The lowest unemployment rate in 40 years and 800,000 new jobs in the past three years. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Well, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister needs to stop saying falsehoods about our record and start telling the truth about his record. A balanced budget. You know how we know it was balanced, Mr. Speaker? Because the finance department said it was. His yeah. own minister's yeah. department told Canadians that the budget was balanced. We did it while lowering taxes and protecting core services for Canadians. But his reckless deficits are putting social services under great pressure. In less than five years, more tax dollars will go to the interest on the debt than is currently being spent on health care. When will the budget be balanced? That Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite wants to talk about the facts. The Conservatives under Stephen Harper had the lowest growth rate in Canadian history since the depths of the Great Depression. Uh, they uh, added $150 billion to our national debt with stubbornly low growth to show for it. We made a different choice, and Mr. Speaker, Canadians supported us in investing in communities, in investing in the middle class, and instead of giving tax boutique credits to the uh, wealthiest Canadians. We focus on growing the economy for everyone. And that Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Well, Mr. Speaker, what the Prime Minister is trying to do is distract from his terrible record by saying things that just aren't true. The Conservative government protected Canada's economy through the worst global recession since the 1920s. We did it while cutting taxes and bringing Canada back to, uh, to balance. But what he has done is racked up massive amounts of new debt. He inherited a great fortune. A for perfect situation for the Canadian economy, a balanced budget and a booming global economy. He has squandered that and blown through the savings. When will the budget be balanced? Right on, Mr. Speaker, this is very interesting. What we see from the Conservatives is a doubling down on Stephen Harper's economic plan, the plan that Canadians soundly rejected in 2015, giving tax breaks to the wealthiest, cutting things like veteran services, uh, health care for refugees, uh, eliminating the long-form census. These are the things that the Harper government did that they are, are once again running on, Mr. Speaker. They have no real plan for the no economy. Plan. We have created 800,000 new jobs and have the... the
Bad. Bad. Honorable, Matter, uh, Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, what the Prime Minister is trying to do is double down on a failed plan of higher taxes and massive deficits, threatening Canadians as we head into difficult economic headwinds. In fact, the IMF said today that there are significant risks that he is worried Canada is not prepared for. But it's not a surprise that the Prime Minister is not worried. He's never had to worry about money. So he doesn't worry about what happens to Canadians when he blows through their savings. When will the Prime Minister understand that the federal budget is not a trust fund for his disposal? Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, what the Conservatives didn't understand and what they obviously failed to understand is you cannot grow the Canadian economy through cuts to services, through cuts to Canadians. You need to invest in Canadians. You need to invest in the middle class and those working hard to join it. You need to invest in infrastructure in their communities. You need to invest in science and research. You need to invest in our young people. And that, Mr. Speaker, is exactly what we've done. And that is how we We've created uh, 800,000 new jobs over the past years and have the lowest uh, unemployment in Honourable The Honourable Member, order please. The Honourable Member for the Honourable Member. <laughs> Through the Panama Papers scandal, governments around the world have recouped over $700 million in fines and back taxes as a result of investigations. In Canada, zero. Just as an example, since 2016, the Australian tax office has recouped more than $48 million. In Canada, zero. When you're not a rich Canadian, you're presumed guilty until you can prove you're innocent and the CRA goes after you with all guns blazing. If you're a wealthy Canadian, you're innocent until proven guilty and you're treated with kids' gloves. Once again, the Prime Minister, why this double standard? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the opportunity to set the record straight. We have made investments of over a billion dollars to give the Canada Revenue Agency the resources needed to crack down on tax evasion and aggressive tax avoidance. On the Panama Papers specifically, the CRA has identified over 3,000 offshore entities with over 2,600 beneficial owners that have some link to Canada, of which the CRA has risk assessed over 80 per cent. I can confirm that there are several criminal investigations under Underway regarding the Panama Papers, which, as my colleague knows, can be complex and require months or years to complete. The Honourable Member for Rimouski, Nejet, Timusqua, Les Basques. Well, it seems that other countries have investigations which are yielding results. I'd like to remind the Prime Minister that the Auditor General does not know how the agency spent that money. Less well off Canadians are intimidated, but those who are wealthy are treated with kid kid gloves. It's been two years that the agency is investigating. It can't even uh, process 3,000 cases related to the Panama Papers, but it's going after 300,000 Canadians who receive social benefits. So why is this government engaging in uh, a double standard, letting the rich get off easy, going after those who are less well off? Mr. Speaker, we've invested over a billion dollars to give the Canada Revenue Agency the resources it needs to go after tax cheats. As far as the Panama Papers are concerned, the agency has identified over 3,000 foreign entities and their beneficial owners who are operating in Canada. The agency has been assessing the risk for 80 percent of these cases, and I can confirm that several criminal investigations are ongoing with regard to the Panama Papers. They're complex and take time. The member for Drummond. Mr. Speaker, based on a report which looked at how countries have performed in terms of climate change, which was made public on Monday at COP24, Canada ranked 54th out of 60. That's shameful. Where is the le leadership promised by the Liberals? We can't, we can't wait to act in 2050. We have to act now. Experts have recommended that the Liberals implement accountability and transparency mechanisms like those proposed by my colleague for Edmonton Strathcona. Will the Liberals listen to the expert or to rich polluters? The Right Honourable the Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the government understands just how important it is to act to protect the environment while creating economic growth, and that is why we have put a price on pollution across the country. We know that putting a price on pollution is the best way 
to bring down our greenhouse gas emissions and also to ensure that families will be able to adapt to changes and prosper in this period of transformation of our economy. We know it's important to fight against climate change for the future of our children, and we're going to do it the right way. Mr. Speaker, Canadians are growing increasingly fearful of reports that impacts of climate change are worsening even beyond what scientists predicted. Pressure is mounting on this government to institute measures to make them more transparent and accountable for the decisions on climate change. The United Kingdom, Germany, Sweden, Denmark, Finland have long ago instituted effective measures to make this happen. Merely appointing yet another hand-picked advisory body just doesn't cut it. Will this Prime Minister support my motion M204 to legally enact binding greenhouse gas targets, a duty to act and measures to ensure improved accountability and transparency for federal act? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we're working to reduce emissions across the Canadian economy to create jobs and meet our international commitments. Our actions include pricing pollution right across the country, accelerating the phase-out of traditional coal power, making historic investments in cleaner infrastructure like public transit and charging stations for electric vehicles, adopting regulations to cut methane emissions from oil and gas by 40 to 45 per cent by 2025, and more. As Canadians know, there is no more choice to be made. We are both protecting the environment and growing the middle class. Excellent. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister has often boasted about inheriting a great family fortune. He's never had to worry about the cost of living, so it's no wonder that he doesn't worry when his policies drive up the cost for Canadians. His tax on gas, on home heating and groceries will hurt seniors, suburban moms and small businesses. And worse, government documents now show that by the year 2022, the carbon tax will have to be six times higher than Liberals now admit, driving up gas prices another whopping 70 cents a litre and home heating by another thousand dollars a year. So what is the full and final price of the Liberal carbon tax? Mr. Speaker, we have put forward a strong and robust plan to address climate change and to support Canadians through this transition. We have a plan, and it's perfectly okay, obviously, for people to ask questions or to criticize or to suggest improvements. What is not correct, Mr. Speaker, is uh, to not recognize that the Conservatives have no plan to fight climate change. They have no idea how to fight climate change and prepare our economy for the future to create the jobs of the future. They don't see it to be as a priority, and Mr. Speaker, that's where they're wrong. Canadians know from wildfires to floods to droughts right across the country, we need to act on climate change, and they are not. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, it's the Liberal government that doesn't have a plan to exactly. reduce emissions in Canada. All their plan is, is a tax grab. The reason why we know it won't reduce emissions is because they've given a massive exemption to the largest emitters in Canada. The full cost of the carbon tax will fall to hard-working Canadian families, commuters, soccer moms, and small businesses. Yep. And worse yet, we know now that the carbon tax will be higher in the future. So, will the Prime Minister tell us what is the full and final price for the Liberal carbon tax? Honourable Prime Minister. Again, Mr. Speaker, if you'll notice, you'll see that the Conservatives do not want to address the question of what their alternative is, how they are going to fight climate change. We've been very clear. We're going to put a price on pollution. We're accelerating the phase out of traditional coal power. We're making historic investments in cleaner infrastructure. We're adopting regulations to cut methane emissions. We are moving forward in a way that is going to support families and protect them for the future, where the Conservatives Conservatives have no plan at all, Mr. No Speaker, plan. and that's unacceptable. No plan. Order, order. All members know that each side will have another chance to uh, take part in this uh, question and answer during question period, this, this, this process of debate. So I'd ask colleagues to try to be patient and wait for their turn. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, it's the Liberal government that has put a price of zero for the largest emitters in Canada. They have granted a huge exemption to large emitters that can afford to hire lobbyists to get a special deal. Hard-working Canadian families, commuters, 
have to bear the full brunt yeah. of this Liberal carbon tax. And now we find out that the carbon tax will have to be even higher in the future. So if the Prime Minister claims that he doesn't mind getting questions, will he answer the simple question, what is the full and final cost of his carbon tax? Here, here. Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, unlike the Conservatives, we believe that emissions need to go down and that we need to continue creating good middle-class jobs for Canadians. So what the Conservatives are saying is actually factually wrong. We have set a target for industry to reduce pollution. If they fail to meet that target, they pay the price. If they do better, for example through innovation, they are rewarded. Our plan will also give money directly to households where the federal backstop applies. The only mystery here is why the Conservatives refuse to have a plan themselves. Andrew. Order. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, they've granted a huge exemption. That is from their own documents. And when a company goes over that target, they don't pay a tax. They can purchase offsets. So they have come up with a scheme that allows the country's largest emitters to avoid paying the carbon tax. But that special deal is not available to hardworking Canadian families, commuters, suburban moms, or small and medium-sized businesses who have to pay the full brunt. We know what the costs are going to be today. What will the full and final cost be for the carbon tax in the future? Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, there are two reasons why the Conservatives are so worked up about our plan. First of all, they have no plan that they can talk about. And secondly, in provinces where the federal backstop applies, Canadian households will be receiving more from the Climate Action Incentive than the cost of pricing pollution. That means that the ones who will pay are the companies who pollute the most. Conservatives like Stephen Harper and Doug Ford and this current leader are so ideologically against any environmental protection, they want to take that money away from Canadians. While Conservatives want to make pollution free again, we're putting it... The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. It's this government's plan that makes emissions free for the largest emitters, and Conservatives are ideologically opposed to a tax that raises the cost of living for Canadians. That will be the choice in the next election, Mr. Speaker. This Prime Minister has failed in so many areas, but there's one file that he is succeeding in. He went around the world and bragged about his plan to phase out Canada's energy sector. And sad to say, it's working. He's chased out new pipeline proponents. He's bringing in a bill that will ensure that no future pipeline gets built. Will the Prime Minister do the right thing and scrap Bill C-69? Mr. Speaker, when the Conservatives talk about scrapping Bill 69, which is focused on giving tighter timelines, uh, a single project, single evaluation, uh, and respond to the concerns of industry, when they talk about scrapping Bill C69, they actually mean let's go back to SIA 2012 that Harper put forward. That was an absolute failure for industry. It was a failure in getting anything built, and it would be a disaster disaster for the oil and gas industry, like for industries right across this country. We will not do that. The Honourable Leader. Mr. Speaker, what the Prime Minister is trying to do is try to convince Canadians that his reckless actions haven't had an impact on the energy sector. But here's the reality. Under the Conservative government, four major pipeline projects were built by private sector dollars increasing our capacity to ship our energy to markets by over a million barrels a day. There were three pipeline projects on the book when he took over. Two are completely dead and one is on a lifeline with no plan to move it forward. So, will the Prime Minister do the right thing and scrap his no more pipeline bill? Mr. Speaker, we've known for a long time, listening to the energy, that their number one priority is getting our oil resources to markets other than the United States. That has been something they have asked for for a long time. Stephen Harper and his Conservatives worked very, very hard to try and get that done, and they didn't get it done for 10 years, Mr. Speaker. We are moving forward in a significant way in the right way, understanding that working with environmental groups, respecting community interests, partnering with Indigenous peoples is the only way to get things done right.
The Honourable Member for Jonquière. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals claim they're working for the middle class, but they always end up taking the side of corporations. They force Canada Post employees back to work. They gave Bombardier our money without strings attached. Lowe's purchased Rona without the government asking for any type of guarantee, and they're not requiring local content quotas for Via Rail's fleet renewal contract, which went to Siemens. Why are they abandoning our middle class workers? The Right Honourable, the Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government is delivering a safe, efficient, and viable rail transportation system. We are going to provide thousands of passengers uh, new opportunities to travel, especially for people with uh, limited mobility. We are going to make traveling greener in this country. As opposed to the previous government, we received the best contract possible to provide Canadians with modern, accessible and high-quality wagons. Dean Liberals masqueraded as progressives, trying to convince Labour they cared. While GM has decided to close their plant in Oshawa, Liberals are nowhere to be seen in the fight to keep these jobs in Canada. When postal workers were fighting for better working conditions, Liberals, like Conservatives before them, legislated them back to work. And the Liberals did nothing to remove Trump's steel and aluminum tariffs, which are costing jobs. 2018 has been defined by Liberals betraying Canadian workers. Why won't the Liberals admit what Canadians see clearly? This this government has never had their backs. Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, from the very beginning, this government has worked in partnership with organized labor in this country. Right. So among the very first things we did was eliminate 525 and 377, the anti-union bills that Conservatives had put forward. We then continue to work uh, with labor, making sure that we get to the bargaining table between labor and employers, and we've demonstrated that the tripartite uh, working model works very well. Right. We know that we're not always going to agree on everything with organized labor, but we do know that basing everything on a respectful approach that values the contributions of labour and the strength of the middle class of this country is the way to do it. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, according to the Parliamentary Budget Officer, the Prime Minister's failure at the border will cost over a billion dollars, and provinces are, are sending their bills to the government, federal government. When will the Prime Minister understand that the only way to stop paying bills for over a billion dollars is to close the breach or, or the loopholes in the third uh, safe third country agreement. The right honorable the prime minister. Mr. Speaker, we are working with the United States. We're working with our provincial partners to make sure that our immigration system will continue to be strong and reliable. We know that there are irregular arrivals. Asylum seekers are a challenge for our system. But at the same time, we can reassure Canadians that uh, we do all necessary security checks. We make sure that our immigration system um, has integrity. We know it is a complex situation, but we are working with the provinces and with our partners, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, not only is this crisis, which has been created by the Prime Minister, will it cost a billion dollars, but uh, it is also difficult for people living near Roxham Road. It's a crisis, and some of the so-called temporary shelters have become permanent. And uh, there are bills to be paid by the provinces. The Prime Minister has to help the provinces uh, and fix this crisis. The Right Honourable, the Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, we are ensuring that our immigration system is compassionate and fair while ensuring our border uh, has integrity and while protecting our communities. We've invested $173 million in border security to speed up the processing of asylum claims. The Conservatives cut the budget of the uh, CBSA by over 300 million, cut services to refugees, and they want Canada to violate international law. We will continue to apply our laws and respect our international obligations. The Leader of the Opposition. Canada's immigration system should be compassionate and fair. There's nothing fair about crossing through an illegal border crossing from a safe part of upstate New York into yep. Canada, jumping the queue, skipping the line, and forcing others to wait longer because more and more resources have to go to those coming into Canada illegally. That is the legacy that this Prime Minister caused with
this irresponsible tweet. And literally, they have done nothing yeah. to stop the problem. Instead of just adding up the costs, will they finally do something to stop the crossings themselves? The right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we are ensuring that our immigration system remains fair and compassionate, all the while ensuring the integrity of our border and the security of our communities. We will continue to ensure that Canadian law is applied and that our international obligations are respected. I will also highlight, Mr. Speaker, in this, the last opportunity for PMQs in this House. It's a pleasure to be taking questions from everyone, not just the Leader of the Opposition, Mr. Speaker. Members want to hear the next question. Order. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. I have good news for the Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker. After the 2019 election, he won't have to answer to questions he doesn't like in this house. Speaker, he asks, he has to answer for the fact that he has done absolutely nothing to stop the illegal border crossings into our country. Now, he can try to hide the truth and say things that aren't true. He knows it was the Conservative government that added 26% worth of Canada service agents at our borders. It's Conservatives who are proposing real solutions to solve this problem. When will he do something about it? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker. I look forward to the opportunity to present our plan to Canadians next year in the federal election. I look forward to, uh, to going against uh, what seems to be the Harper Conservative platform once again. Mr. Speaker, the Harper Conservatives cut $390 million. Order. Far too much noise. I know everyone's excited uh, about Christmas after the poem and all that, but uh, we need to calm down and hear each other, even if we don't like what may be said by the other side sometimes. The Honourable Prime Minister has the floor. Mr. Speaker, I suggest you give them a little indulgence. They all want an opportunity to ask questions and make comments, Mr. Speaker, on this last day of Prime Minister question period in this uh, House of Commons. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, we're going to continue uh, to stand up for Canadians and ensure that things move forward properly. That's something we committed to Canadians. The Honourable Member for St. Hyacinth Bagot. Alors, order. The Honourable Member for St. Hyacinth Bagot. Mr. Speaker, the Liberal government has made countless commitments to First Nations and promised billions for infrastructure to improve their living conditions. And yet many Indigenous communities don't have access to clean drinking water and won't before 2021. That's not good enough. Some communities have been boiling their water for 25 years and they'll have to wait another three? Come off it! Providing drinking water to Indigenous communities is the responsibility of this government. Are they going to do something about it now? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we recognize what a problem it is having no access to drinking water on reserve. And that's why we committed to eliminate all boil water advis advisories in this country. And we will get there. We've eliminated 73 so far. We know there's still more work to be done, but we're doing that work and we will keep that promise, Mr. Speaker. I think Mr. Nippy, Churchill River. The Prime Minister should be ashamed of himself for saying that. Mr. Speaker, with the closure of STC in Saskatchewan, people with disabilities in northern Saskatchewan are being left in the dark by the Liberals. People like Gary Tinker from Pine House, Saskatchewan are forced to hitchhike across the province to get to appointments, to see their families, or just to live a normal life. 
People with disabilities can't wait until after the election. What are the Liberals waiting for to help Northerners like Gary and restore the bus service? Well, Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we were extremely concerned with the decision by Greyhound to suspend uh, bus service uh, uh, across parts of the north and the west. And that's why we've been working with local communities, why we've been working uh, with other providers to ensure that there are alternatives in place, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we have created programs uh, in partnering and allowing uh, Indigenous communities to step up. We recognize this situation uh, is uh, difficult on top of an already difficult situation. That's why we're working in partnership with with Indigenous communities to solve this problem, and I thank the member opposite for her question and for her work on this file. The Honourable Member for Malpec. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. In 2016, our government reached an historic agreement with the provinces and territories to expand the Canada Pension Plan to protect income security for pensioners. That CPP expansion is supposed to begin this year, but the Conservative Party opposes that expansion, which will allow greater security for pensioners. Will the Prime Minister assure the House, despite the opposition from the Conservatives, that the CPP will be expanded as intended? Honourable Prime Minister. By thanking the member from Malpec for his hard work as chair of the Finance Committee and his extraordinary service to this House and to Canada. We worked with the provinces and territories to reach a historic agreement which will help ensure Canadians get the secure and dignified retirement they deserve. The Enhanced Canada Pension Plan will mean Canadians receive up to $7,000 more per year when they retire. This means that more Canadians will be able to actually retire at, at age 65. Despite the Conservative Position, we are moving forward with That's the CPP right. expansion Excellent. to make sure Canadians have a secure retirement. Yeah. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, there, the, deal, the NAFTA deal has been a disaster with a long list of concessions around auto, prescription drugs and dairy. The deal is so bad that the main economic advisor to Donald Trump said that Canada gave generously. Why didn't the Prime Minister get the tariffs on aluminum and steel scrapped during the negotiations? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, our first goal since the beginning of the negotiations was to reach a good deal for Canada, and that's precisely what we did. The deal will protect the over $2 billion a day in trade across our border and will remove tariffs on over 70 percent of Canadian exports and improve living conditions for Canadians. The rules will be fairer in auto. There's a binational conflict resolution mechanism, and it will protect supply management. The Conservatives wanted to follow Stephen Harper's advice and sign any old deal. Mr. Speaker, the, the Prime Minister didn't say he would go to Washington to get a good deal. He said he would go and get a better deal. But let's look at the deal he got. He uses the word capitulate. It was the Liberals who capitulated on dairy, signing away market access and preventing our farmers from exporting. It's the Liberals who agreed to a cap on auto exports. They agreed to adopt Donald Trump's pharmaceutical regime, yep. increasing costs for Canadian pa patients. Now, after giving all that away to Donald Trump, did the Prime Minister get any assurances on when steel and aluminum tariffs would finally be lifted? Right, right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I want to take a moment once again to thank all the Canadians from across the country, including of different ideologies, including some Conservatives, who worked hard uh, to uh, negotiate the right deal for Canada. We can be assured that this was a deal that continues to secure our access to our most important trading partner at a time of uncertainty and unpredictability from that trading partner. In the fa we got rid of the ratchet cause, which infringed upon our sovereignty by preventing our government from controlling access to our energy resources. We kept Chapter 19. The cultural exemption will apply to digital programs. We Member for Selkirk, Interlake, Eastman, uh, I think will do well to restrain himself a bit. Uh, order, order. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. I am convinced the Prime Minister had to Google what the ratchet clause was. <laughs> before he
Prime Minister points to as a victory was something that a previous Conservative government already got for Canadians. But he had one bargaining chip left, Mr. Speaker. He told Donald Trump that if he didn't get rid of tariffs, there would be no photo op. Well, the Donald called his bluff. And he knew that the Prime Minister couldn't resist another photo being taken. And there he was, signing along with the rest of the leaders. Now, in exchange for taking his picture with Donald Trump, did he get an end to the steel and aluminum tariffs? Mr. Speaker, it's wonderful to be able to look into this space and see every seat filled. Uh, and I know there may be a few people here who are here for the first time. But let me tell you, the Conservative benches. How many more sleeps? <laughs> Order. Order. <laughs> Members may not like what they hear on the other side or, well, whether their own side or not, it's up to them, but we have to listen to others in our democracy. Whether we like it or not, we do that. The Right Honourable Prime Minister has the floor. Mr. Speaker, allow me to express that the Conservative Party is usually a lot more quiet than this. They're usually a lot more respectful. But on this, the very last day of a Wednesday question period in the House, I think they all want to be heard. That is the problem. Mr. Speaker, will the Leader of the Opposition allow some of his fellow members to ask questions of the Prime Minister? Apparently not. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Well, Mr. Speaker and ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> this is what happens when a Prime Minister doesn't like the questions, when he has to answer for his failed record on carbon taxes, on deficits, on signing away concession after concession to Donald Trump without anything in return. He starts to ask for someone else to ask him a question. Well, don't worry, Mr. Speaker, through you. The Prime Minister needn't worry for too long, because come 2019, Mr. Speaker, Canadians will send someone into that chair who isn't afraid of the tough questions and actually puts Start caroling next, right? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, after 10 years of Stephen Harper's government, we step forward with a fresh plan to invest in Canadians, to invest in communities. And that plan, Mr. Speaker, is working. Over 800,000 new jobs over the past three years, the lowest unemployment rate in over 40 years. Canadians are more confident about the future, looking to their kids' future with optimism. We have a plan on climate change. We are taking, uh, taking action on building a stronger future. Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives have only a failed plan to fall back on because they are presenting no new ideas of their own, Mr. Speaker. Honourable member for Vancouver East. Lisa Montagna and her family arrived in Canada in 2012, fleeing violence and extortion in Colombia. As a legacy case, they've been in limbo for six years. Louisa is married to a Canadian, and their son Thomas was born in Canada. The family of seven is fully integrated and thriving. Violence in Colombia has displaced millions, and Canadian government has issued an alert to avoid travel there. But this family is being deported on Christmas oh. Eve. This is a cruel way for the minister to meet his quota to deport 10,000 asylum seekers. Will the prime minister direct his ministers to intervene? The right honourable prime minister. Mr. Speaker, 
Canada has an immigration system that is based on rules and principles, and we follow those rules. Canadians are among the few people on this planet who are, as a whole, generally positively inclined towards immigration because they know our system works. Our system is based on rules and procedures and processes. Uh, we uh, know that sometimes the decisions can be difficult, and we will, of course, uh, take a look at all files on compassionate grounds. But we will continue to apply our immigration system based on the rules and the facts of the cases. Honourable Member for Windsor West. My answer lets a nation and a family down. Yes. Canadians are subjected to unfair internet data overcharges, restrictions when switching internet providers, and misleading aggressive telecom practices. Yep. The CRTC says they want to establish a consumer internet code of conduct, but they fail to provide sufficient time for consumer groups and the public. Wow. The result? A boycotted and broken system. Consumer groups have been clear. They want an extension so they can participate. Why is the Prime Minister allowing the CRTC to make up a toothless code of conduct for consumers in Canada? Yeah. Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we're proud of the work we're doing with the CRTC to ensure that our, our uh, digital programming and our protection of our airwaves uh, keeps pace with the transformations of our economy. We recognize uh, there are more and more needs for data and for proper uh, uh, access to, to broadband. That is something that we're continuing to invest invest in across the country and work with the CRTC on. Although it's odd to see the, uh, the uh, NDP complaining about this when they're the ones who want to impose extra taxes on internet usage for Canadians. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Monsieur le Président, le nouveau gouvernement de... Mr. Speaker, the new Quebec government has made a number of decisions in various areas since taking office. They've received clear mandates from the public. And what's the Prime Minister's reaction, as usual, it is to lecture Quebec. When will the Prime Minister get it through his head that there are areas of provincial jurisdiction that Quebec is fully entitled to occupy without being criticized by this centralizing Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Prime Minister? Mr. Speaker, I was very happy to sit down for the fifth time with the provincial and territorial premiers last week to talk frankly about how we're going to keep working together. That's something Stephen Harper refused to do throughout his term of office because he didn't want to talk to the provinces. I believe in cooperation and I'd like to point out that the work we're doing with the province of Quebec is going very well and we are taking their viewpoint into consideration and trying to improve the lot of Quebecers and all Canadians, the Leader of the Opposition. It's not a matter of having meetings with the provinces, it's a matter of respecting the provinces. In Lévis, the Davy shipyard workers have delivered on time, within budget, for the asterisk supply ship, and now the Navy needs another one, the Obelix. Davy Shipyard is ready to do the work. The Prime Minister has to stop playing political games and before Christmas should award that contract to Davy. What's he waiting for? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I can't believe the member opposite has just asked me to stop playing politics on this file because he's the one playing petty politics. The armed forces did an assessment. They don't need the Obelix. And for him to suggest that we should buy it anyway is pure base politics, the worst kind of politics. We make our decisions based on facts. We recognize the quality of work done by Davy Shipyard, and we do want them to get good jobs. But we're not going to make up work uh, for political reasons. The Honorable Leader of the Opposition. I'd like to hear him say that to our men and women in the armed forces and the Davy shipyard workers. When you look at this prime minister's failures, you see that instead of treating the provinces like partners, he's paternalistic toward them. The new Quebec premier identified a priority for dealing with uh, mobility in the old capital. Is the Prime Minister willing to partner around that project for Quebec City? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, 
Mr. Speaker, we have made record investments in infrastructure over the past few years. We've shown that we're there to support our partners, but the project my colleague refers to doesn't even exist yet. It's just an idea. Once there's a proposal and a plan, we will certainly take a look at it. That's what we're here for. But once again, we shouldn't be inventing projects for political to score political points. We base our decisions on facts, on real projects. And the project he's talking about isn't there yet. But when it is, we'll work with them. Vancouver Centre. Order. Mr. Speaker, our Prime Minister grew up in British Columbia and knows that the southern resident killer whale is iconic to the people of our province. Sadly, these marine mammals face significant threats to their survival. For 10 years, the Harper government failed to take any measures to protect the environment that actually sustains species hoppers. Our government has a plan. Can the Prime Minister update British Columbians on our most recent initiative to save the precious species? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, Allah. I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for Vancouver Centre for her hard work and for her extraordinary service to our country. We recognise that a strong economy and a clean environment go hand in hand and that we must grow our economy responsibly. Canadians and marine mammals have waited long enough during the ten long years of Harper Conservative inaction. That's why in Budget 2018, we announced concrete action to fix this problem. We will now have the needed and enforceable tools to address immediate and long-term threats to the marine environment, including marine mammals and the southern resident killer whale. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, another massive failure for this Liberal government under this Prime Minister has been the ethics file. This is the only Prime Minister in Canadian history to have been found guilty of breaking Ooh. ethics laws, and several other members of his team followed suit. The Finance Minister conveniently forgot about a villa in France, and other ministers have been found guilty of breaking rules. Now there's a massive investigation with a big cloud of suspicion around a Liberal, former Liberal MP and a Liberal Cabinet Minister. So can the Prime Minister tell us exactly how many more Liberals are currently being investigated by the RCMP or other police? Speaker, the member opposite just got censured by uh, the Ethics Commissioner for having told one of his members to break the ethics rules. Mr. Speaker, we will take no lessons on ethics from them or uh, from the legacy of 10 years of, uh, of, uh, uh, of mis- uh, how shall I say it? Uh, the kinds of practices that were all too, too common under the Harper Conservatives, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Order. That member for Banff, Airdrie, will come to order, please. We each have our turns. We wait for our turns. And now it's the turn, and the Prime Minister will wait his turn also. It's now the turn of the Honourable Member for Esquimalt. Order. Esquimalt Saanich Souk. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, the number of Canadians being infected with HIV is once again rising rapidly among young gay men and has reached epidemic proportions in Indigenous communities. Yet the Liberals have cut funding to many frontline HIV agencies and failed to increase access to testing when we know that knowing your status is the key to reducing new infections. Will the Liberal government move quickly to approve home testing kits for sale in pharmacies to help reach all men who have sex with men and work with the provinces to ensure that testing is widely available without needing to see a doctor first. The Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we know that we've made uh, strong strides forward in the fight against HIV AIDS, but we do know that there is much more to do. That is why uh, Health Canada is working with our provincial partners to ensure that there are even more ways uh, for Canadians to stay safe, more ways for Canadians to counter uh, this terrible e epidemic that we know uh, continues despite all, all the efforts uh, that we and others are putting forward to counter it. Uh, we understand, as always, there is more to do, and we uh, look forward to working with the member opposite and all members in this House uh, to continue to address uh, this terrible challenge. The Honourable Member for West Nova. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Nova Scotia depends on fisheries, and that's why I was excited to hear the Minister of Fisheries announce last week $18 million in funding through the Atlantic Fisheries Fund for investments in ag aquaculture, science, partnerships, innovation, and research development. 
Could the Prime Minister update this House about what else the government is doing to support fisheries all across Canada? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. I'd like to thank the member for Nova West for his great work on the Fisheries Committee and for the excellent work he's done on behalf of his riding. Our government has invested in many projects all across the region. We have our BC Salmon Restoration and Innovation Fund, $100 million. And in Quebec, we're investing $30 million to support Quebec's fish and seafood sector. As you can see, our government is protecting our biodiversity across Canada. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And before I ask my question, I just want to take this opportunity as the last uh, question period uh, on a Wednesday of Prime Minister's questions uh, to wish the Prime Minister the very best on a personal basis for him and his family. I hope all parliamentarians and all party uh, members enjoy some time with their friends and family and connect with their constituents. And in the spirit of giving, Mr. Speaker, I have given the, op the Prime Minister 23 opportunities to answer simple and straightforward questions. I have one more gift for the Prime Minister. I'm going to give him one final chance to tell Canadians in what year the budget will be balanced. Yeah. <laughs> Unwrap that. Right? The right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the member opposite's kind words. I wish him and his family, indeed, all members in this House, a happy and safe uh, and Merry Christmas we, and uh, happy holidays. We know uh, that this is uh, a time of the year when we are a long way from our, our families. We still have a couple more days, at least, of work to do in this House. Uh, so we know uh, that, uh, that the days grow uh, longer, the days grow shorter, uh, but the time seems to grow longer. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we put forward a fiscally responsible plan that is growing the economy the way Canadians expect us to, we will keep working on creating jobs and growing the economy for all Canadians. The Honourable Member for Bécancourt, Nicolette Sorel. Mr. Speaker, the decision is made. Via Rail prefers a $1.3 billion deal with a German multinational rather than a Quebec company. A deal to purchase trains that will run in Quebec. Hell of a Christmas present. In La Pocatière, people are being laid off while the corks are popping in Sacramento. How can the Prime Minister justify his decision to ignore workers in La Pocatière and let Via Rail pick Siemens? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government wants us to have a safe efficient rail system in Canada. We've invested to make it possible for millions of passengers to travel on new trains, trains for passengers with uh, mobility issues. And unlike the previous government, we got the best possible deal to provide Canadians with modern, more accessible, high quality train cars. Or to inform the House that the Honourable Member for Carlton is rising on a point of order, rising from question period. Yes, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, point of order. I uh, rise today uh, in the Christmas spirit and also in a spirit of great nonpartisanship. The table, uh, under unanimous consent, to table a copy of the Liberal platform which promises a balanced budget in 2019. Thank you very much. Does the honourable member have unanimous consent? There is no unanimous consent. The Honourable Member for Durham is rising. Order. The Member for Durham is rising on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, there have been discussions uh, amongst the parties and an email sent to all members of Parliament uh, with respect to this motion. And if you seek it, I believe you will find unanimous consent for the mo this motion, seconded by the Member from Oshawa, that the Standing Committee on Industry, Science and Technology be instructed to undertake a study of no less than four meetings to investigate the impact of the announced closure of the General Motors Automotive Assembly Plant in Ottawa, that the study, one, include impacted stakeholders such as the Union Unifor to solicit input towards devising a plan to address issues that may have contributed to this announcement, two, provide an opportunity for the Minister of Innovation, Science and Economic Development to appear to address, to appear to address concerns about competitiveness raised by General Motors and any other, mem any other issues the Minister deems instructive toward developing a plan and that the Committee report its findings to this House of Commons no later than March 11, 2019.
Does the honourable member have the unanimous consent of the House to propose the motion? No, there is no unanimous consent. Order. Order. I know you all want to hear this. It's exciting stuff. Order. I have the honour to inform the House that messages have been received from the Senate informing this House that the Senate has passed the following bills to which the concurrence of the House is desired. Bill S-244, an act respecting Kindness Week. Bill S-1003, an act to amend the United Church of Canada Act. This second bill is deemed to have been read the first time in order for a second reading at the next sitting of the House. Come il a trois As it is 325, pursuant to the order adopted Tuesday, November 11, 2018, the House will now proceed with the deferred recorded vote on Motion M-163 under private members' business in the name of Mr. Wojnesti. Call in the members. The question